Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We welcome you to yet another very interesting session on the theme, Could This Be the Decade for the Emerging Markets? And to talk on this subject, we have with us Mr. Ruchi Sharma, Head of Emerging Markets and Chief Global Strategist, Morgan Stanley Investment Management. I now request Mr. Sanjeev Mehta, Vice President Fiki and CMD Hindustan Unilever Limited to kindly take the session forward by opening and moderating this session. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm delighted to welcome Mr. Ruchi Sharma and I'm certain this will be a very exciting session. Ruchi is an authority on developing and emerging markets. His data-centric approach and empirical insights make even the most challenging issues easy and simple to understand. He's an investor and a writer. He's a regular contributor to New York Times, and his work appears in several journals and newspapers. Richard is a prolific writer and has several bestsellers to his credit. I vividly remember discussing the heterogeneity of India when he was working on his book, Democracy on the Road. Richard is neither an armchair economist nor an armchair author. He keeps his feet on the soil and ears to the ground. Richard, there was a period when brick was the flavor of the day. Brick got extended to bricks. Not all the bricks lived up to their potential, and the word fragile got prefixed to a few. The current pandemic and the attendant crisis is manifesting in several ways. The global trade has shrunk, globalization is in retreat, and there is absence of global leadership to tackle the crisis in a concerted manner. The G20 have poured in trillions of dollars in stimulus, whereas some of the emerging world runs the risk of pushing millions of people who had been pulled out of poverty trap back into poverty. India, we believe, is in a sweet spot to convert the challenges into massive opportunities. Today, we heard honorable prime ministers and several senior ministers and bureaucrats talk about the reforms that have been done, but more importantly, those that are underway to boost agriculture, manufacturing, MSMEs, and the path-breaking and ambitious production-linked incentives, and many more. Ruchir, we would love to hear your views about the prospects of emerging markets, especially India. And most importantly, what in your view, India needs to do to achieve its growth ambition? And what would it take for it to benefit from the opportunities that are emerging in the world? A very eager audience awaits you, Ruchir. Over to you. Thanks, Sanjeev. A pleasure to join this AGM. Uh, I've spoken before at Fiki, but never at the AGM. So this is a special occasion. And uh, you obviously have a great lineup here and uh, delighted to be a part of it. So what I've done here is to have prepared a presentation uh, to ask the question that Uday had suggested to me that could this be the decade of emerging markets? Uh, so if we get the presentation going, I would be happy to take you through it. Great, thanks. So if you move to the first slide, the, what you see here is um, that the last decade was really a lost decade for the emerging economies. What this chart shows you is what is the share of emerging markets in the global economy. So see what's happened here, which is that the only major emerging economy to have gained share in the global economy over the last decade has been China. China's share in the global economy has exploded, whereas the share of other emerging markets put together has in fact declined over the last decade. The share of the rest of the emerging economies in the global economy is essentially <laughs> unchanged since 1950, which is that ex-China, all the developing economies in the world, which account for 80% of the world's population, represent just 20% of the global economy. That's a share that has been roughly unchanged in post-World War II history. This belies a lot of the expectations that were built of the emerging markets. We had a terrific boom in the 2000s in which India also participated. In that boom, as you can see, the share of emerging economies in the world exploded. It went up from 
barely 15% at the start of 2000, it more than doubled to over 20% by the time the decade ended. That led to a lot of promise, a lot of hope. And yet in the last decade, that hope has not been realized. And China has really been the only major emerging market where the share in the global economy just exploded. So including China, massive increase in the developing economy share in the global economy, excluding China, a period of great disappointment is how I put it. So move to the next slide. That for the stock markets, this was the worst decade in fact for stock market investing in the emerging economy. These are dollar returns. And this is where I think in India also, we tend to get a bit misled because we get so taken up by what's happening to the Sensex, what's happening to the Nifty. Remember that those benchmarks are all taking into account inflation as well. But in inflation adjusted terms or in dollar terms, the Indian stock market today is not really any higher than it was at the peak of the boom in 2007. We are roughly back at the same level in inflation adjusted or in dollar terms. And that's true for most emerging economies that we had. Uh, if you look at the decadal returns, this has been the worst decade for emerging stock market returns since uh, we have the records going back to the 1930s. So some great decades of returns, the last decade very poor, reflecting the fact that the great promise that emerging economies held in 2010 coming after that great boom have just not materialized. So moving to the next slide. See what the hype was like for emerging economies in 2010. Cover stories all over the world, uh, whether it was India, whether it was Brazil, Asia, uh, and even Africa. Uh, the cover story of The Economist, these are Economist editions that we take uh, in the 2009 and 2012 period. Uh, uh, you know, how India's growth will outpace China's with all these bold projections. And that entire hype now is gone. Uh, the cover stories, much to the chagrin of uh, many of the governments, or these magazines today have a very different cover line that they project for these economies. So as you move to the next slide, the problem really has to do with exaggerated expectations. So what this chart shows is that the long-term history is this, that there are now 200 economies in the world. Of these 200 economies, only 39 are classified as developed economies. Everyone else is classified as emerging. And many of these economies from Brazil to South Africa to Mexico have been emerging forever, uh, which is that they have a great decade and then after that, for the next decade, they regress, they go back down. So what we saw in this period of 2000 to 2010, uh, right up until the early part of the decade, uh, was a lot of these economies were doing very well and converging in terms of their per capita income with the United States. But that was a very unusual period. Historically, if you look at it, in any year, Roughly about half the economies tend to grow faster than the United States, and the other half tend to grow slower in per capita income terms. So it is not a birth given right that all these emerging economies, because they start from a low base, will end up converging with the United States. The United States with a per capita income of $60,000 is still the preeminent economy in the world, despite many projections which keep on suggesting about its decline. And many of these emerging economies struggle to catch up with the United States. So if we move on to the next slide. That this was what happened in the last decade, which is that great promise, but that promise has not been fulfilled. Now coming up to this decade, I think that I'm much more optimistic. When I wrote my first book, Breakout Nations, in 2011-12, the main thesis of that book was that the BRICS are way overhyped and the true emerging market is America. That was what I wrote in that book. I only wish I'd organized my investing career accordingly to be more in line with that, given how well the United States has done over the last decade and given what the other emerging economies have done. But having lived through that period now, at this juncture, at the start of a new decade, 
I feel more optimistic about the emerging economies for four reasons that I'm going to go through in detail here. Uh, whether it's the traditional model of old school manufacturing, the fact that commodity prices, I think, are about to revive. And then the most important point for India as well, that the only time these emerging economies carry out any meaningful reform is when they have that back to the wall. And lastly, the digital revolution that's taking place uh, across the emerging economies and something which could benefit them a lot. So if you go into these details, uh, I'll try and sort of lay out why I feel more optimistic about India and the emerging economies in the coming decade. So if you move to the next slide, what we know historically is this, that if there has been one secret to economic success, it is about manufacturing exports. If you look at all the great economies which have grown at a rapid pace, in post-war history, the single most important secret has been manufacturing and exporting your way to prosperity. That is what happened. That's what led Japan, then Korea, then Taiwan, then China to grow at a very rapid pace. The problem that India and other emerging economies face is that we are now entering in a period of deglobalization, where global trade as a share of GDP is in fact declining. Manufacturing as a share of global GDP is stagnating. In that period, to try and export your way to prosperity becomes much more difficult. Having said that, as the next slide shows, that there are still a few economies that are able to grow very rapidly uh, and gain export share. So if you move to slide eight, the next slide, that which are these economies which are still gaining share in global exports and therefore following a path of exporting the way to prosperity. As you can see, China, Vietnam, Mexico, and interestingly, even India has made some marginal gains here. That if you look at the share of global exports since 2010, India also has seen a slight increase in its share of global exports, nothing compared to what the likes of China, Vietnam have seen, but India has seen some increase in that. So, some sliver of optimism out here that manufacturing and including exports of the share of GDP in India is increasing, nowhere close to the pace that we see in the powerful East Asian economies, but some increase which is taking place there, and that offers some reason of hope to me. So we move to slide nine. Southeast Asia has always been at the forefront of rapid economic growth. And uh, so this is a recent survey where we ask U.S. companies uh, in China if they plan to relocate, and if so, where biggest beneficiaries are in Southeast Asia, followed by Mexico, and then the Indian subcontinent. Uh, so again, there is potential. We are seeing some right movement, just not on the same scale that we see in some of the East Asian economies, uh, such as Vietnam and possibly even Indonesia and Malaysia, where we see factories moving. So if we move to page 10, now, this is the second thing. The reality of emerging economies is that they are very dependent on commodity prices. Now, India is a bit different, but most emerging economies, commodities tend to be the big exports. The problem with that is this, that commodity prices over time tend to decline in inflation-adjusted terms. So when you end up having uh, your economies very tied to commodity prices, the problem is that you end up having boom-bust cycles because commodity prices over time tend to decline, not increase over time. And so that is why economies tied to commodity prices uh, don't tend to converge with the per capita income levels of countries such as the United States. So moving to the next slide, which are uh, these economies, as you can see? That you can see here that it is typically when commodity prices rise, emerging economies in general tend to get a lift. Uh, now, commodity prices tend to rise one decade, fall another decade. And as you can see here, that when commodity prices rose strongly, such as in the 2000s, such as in the 1970s, that's what has been a very powerful pull for all the emerging economies on the upside. Moving to the next slide. So which are the nations which are very tied to commodity prices? There's obviously Brazil, then uh, there's some changes taking place as well with net 
zero regulation that could promote green electrification and with uh, producers of nickel, aluminium, lithium. These are, and above all, copper. These are leading exporters today in the new world. Uh, Chile, Peru could be beneficiaries. And then obviously, like even a move to a more hydrogen economy could help uh, boost exporters of platinum led by South Africa and even in Russia. So higher commodity prices typically tend to bode well for emerging economies as well. And the truth is this, that, for that a lot of the commodity prices have been in a period of decline over the last decade. But after such a long period of decade, the next uh, decade for commodity prices tends to be better because a lot of supply gets rationalized and cut out. And so that's what may have happened as well over the last decade. Now, as we move to the next slide, this I think is very important. A big drag on many emerging economies is this, that many of them get caught in this, what I call a circle of life, which is that emerging economies only tend to carry out economic reform when they face a crisis. That, that reform that they carry out leads to a revival. The problem is that the revival then again leads to complacency, the gains are frittered away, and you once again are in a crisis mode. So you end up having these economies which never tend to progress over time, because they're constantly caught in the circle of life. The good news is this, that this pandemic, in a way, has thrown many emerging economies into some sort of a crisis. So they're being forced to carry out economic reform. And this is a very important distinction from the developed world. In the developed world, they've been using a lot of stimulus because they have the financial wherewithal to do so. In emerging economies, they don't have the financial wherewithal to use a lot of the stimulus. So instead, what they have been doing is that they have been uh, trying to reform to try and grow. Now, this in the long term is, to me, a much better solution compared to uh, just uh, uh, throwing stimulus at the problem. Because throwing stimulus offers a short term fix, not a long term problem, uh, not a long term uh, solution to the problem. So we move to the next slide. You can see the list of emerging economies that are carrying out reform. We know in India, this controversy about agriculture and labor reforms, but at least these reforms are finally being carried out uh, after a long hiatus. Indonesia, we are similarly seeing a major overall of the labor and tax laws. Brazil, finally doing something about reining in its massive uh, uh, state, welfare state. Saudi Arabia, Egypt, UAE, all countries which are now finally carrying out reforms. So this is the upside, which is that because these countries do not have the financial wherewithal to spend, they are being forced to carry out economic reforms to boost productivity and therefore boost economic growth and keep the animal spirits of the economy going. Very different from the emerging economies. A decade ago, after, uh, when you had the 2008 financial crisis, it was very different. Many of the emerging economies thought that, that this was a developed world problem and they had done very well over a decade, and so they ended up stimulating a lot, but they did not do anything for economic reforms. Whereas in the uh, United States, they did do stimulus, but they cleaned up the banking sector and then were able to set themselves up for a decade of strong performance. So this is the opposite which is going on here, but could be a silver lining of the pandemic. The last point I'm going to make in terms of the other factor, if you move to page 15, uh, as to what could happen, you know, is the digital revolution uh, that how that it is spreading very fast now in the emerging economy. This is a new model which is coming up. You know, you've often had new technology come, but it takes a time for the technology to really have its full impact on economies. It took many decades before the steam engine, the railroads truly transformed the global economy. And now what we're seeing is that if you look at digital revenue, the median growth in emerging economies, it is now outpacing that of the developed market. So this is a new frontier for economic growth, which is emerging, whether it's fintech or it's got to do with you know, the payment systems, that these new technologies which are coming could help boost growth in emerging economies in a much more domestic oriented way. So if you move to the next slide. Uh, you can see that the new internet giants which are emerging from Poland to Argentina. So this is a model that China first showed. China showed to us that it was possible to grow very rapidly 
using technology because I used to be very worried about the massive debt situation in China that the old economy there had accumulated. But where China surprised me was in the last four to five years, the way China has used technology to grow, to create a virtual cashless economy. If you go to China today, as many of you have done before the pandemic, you will see the way technology has transformed that economy, uh, where the use of robots uh, to serve in restaurants and drones to make deliveries is not just alternative reality, but something that's actually happening out there. So you, so China showed us that how you can, you can use technology as a new growth engine and many other emerging economies are trying to follow the same path. We're seeing these new companies, these new internet giants from Poland to Argentina come up and has some pretty serious market caps, as you can see out there. Uh, you know, so you've got these Amazon, Alibaba, the local variations come up in many of these economies. So we're seeing this digitization spread across the emerging world now and offer a new revenue for growth. So as we move to the next slide, uh, as you can see here, the cost of starting a business, how it's dramatically falling in emerging economies. Uh, that if you look at it uh, on a per capita income basis, the cost of starting a business has fallen dramatically over the last 20 years. And on a log scale, it's even more accelerated over the last three to four years. So this is something which is, again, a major productivity boost, I think, for the emerging economies at this juncture if it's used properly. So now, I think we have to put this all in perspective. If I move to the next slide on page 18, uh, it's very important to put this in perspective which is this, that the 2000s was a very exceptional period for the global economy and particularly like the emerging economies. There were about 100 economies in, two, uh, in 2007 that were growing at a pace of 7% or more. That had never happened in the history of the global economy. In the last decade, there have only been 10 economies in the world that have grown at a rate of 7% or more in any year dramatic fall down from 100 to just 10. That's because of many reasons. Demographics being the one, including in India, our population growth rate is slowing down. It is a very powerful driver of economic growth. If the population growth though is slowing down, you can't grow at the same pace as you did when your population growth was three or 4% compared to 2%. That's just a mathematical uh, equation. So what we need to understand here is that these new drivers of economic growth are emerging, but Having said that, you, our expectations have to be realistic. And so in breakout nations, when I wrote my book, I had said that for a country like India, 7% plus should, has to be the threshold for judging economic success. That, if, that only if we grow at above 7% is that a criteria of, or is that a criteria that we meet for being an economic success. The difference today is this that I think the benchmark for economic success for countries with a per capita income of less than $5,000, such as India, is 5%. That if we can grow at more than 5% a year, that is a significant achievement. Forget about growing at 7% or more. The global economy has changed. The demographics have changed. Uh, it is no longer feasible in a world of deglobalization to grow at such a pace because your exports cannot grow at 20, 30% a year, which it could in an era of globalization. So for an economy like India, a growth rate of more than 5% will be pretty credible. Uh, even in this era where I think that emerging economies in general uh, make some sort of a comeback. Now for the developed economies such as the United States, a growth rate of even one or 2% in this era of declining demographics and deglobalization will be good. So I think that, that this is a very important point to keep in mind. And the next slide just shows you how the ch uh, changes have taken place. If you look at the next slide, just look at the number of economies now growing at a rate of even more than 5%. It is very rare today uh, that in the peak of the era in 2007, more than 60% of economies in the world were growing at a rate of more than 5% in any given year. Today, only about 20% of economies in the world are growing at a rate of more than 5%. And barely any economies are growing at a rate of more than 7%. Uh, so this is the new definition 
of economic success. To summarize on my last slide, what I say here is this. Uh, so if you move to the next slide, please, that some of the rest will rise again after a decade of such disappointment and the candidates which will rise will do so powered by four growth engines. One has to still do with the old school of manufacturing because that has traditionally been the one secret to economic success, just that the path is narrowing because the world's exports and manufacturing aren't growing as rapidly as they once were. Secondly, commodity prices. We get a revival in commodity prices that generally helps emerging economies because many of them tend to be commodity exporters. Third, pandemic driven reform. This is what we're seeing in many economies in the emerging world that because they are in a crisis mode with their back to the wall, they're being forced to carry out reforms, which is good for productivity and therefore long term growth. And lastly, the digital revolution that's sweeping the emerging world as well now and increasingly so as the technology gets diffused. And here, China, Taiwan, Korea are in particular the uh, real research and development kingpins. And then you also have the fintech payments revolution sweeping across parts of East Africa South and Southeast Asia and Eastern Europe. Uh, so I think that it's this constellation that comes together, which could help make this a better decade for the emerging markets compared to the very disappointing decade we had after the lofty expectations that were created following the boom of the 2000s. The only caveat that keep your expectations in check, remember that given the changed demographics and deglobalization, what you can hope to grow in this era is very different compared to what we did in that freakish decade of the 2000s that anchors a lot of our thinking. Uh, so that really is what my thought is about the emerging world and would love to open the floor for any questions that Sanjeev uh, and others may have. Thanks, Ruchir. Uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, the good history and perspective of the DND world and how they grew in the past. Yeah, you're also a very good student of politics. In the post-Trump era, how do you see the world order playing out? And uh, what do you think should be India's gain to gain disproportionately from the new world order? Right. I think that, uh, you know, as far as the Trump era is concerned, I'm not sure that how much, you know, like it's a post-Trump era because the U.S. remains as divided as ever. Uh, as you well know that uh, it was a very close election and it remains very divided. So I'm not sure how much Trump's uh, defeat changes uh, the politics of the world. I think that in general, if there's been a silver lining of the pandemic, it is the fact that it has rewarded more of the competent and calmer leaders and populists in general have not done that well navigating this pandemic. So, uh, you know, I think it's time to look at the silver linings of the pandemic. And even though I don't think that much has changed in politics, but if you really are to force me to say something, I think it is the fact that it has changed marginally for the better with the populace across the world uh, not coping with it as well compared to the, uh, uh, the traditionalists who seem to have made some sort of uh, comeback. I think as far as India is concerned, um, I think that it's very clear to us. The, uh, I think what we have to do is that uh, we have to sort of do much better with our neighbors. I think that is something which is very critical because one of the slides I did not have here in the interest of time is that possibly the single biggest drag of economic growth in South Asia has been that intra-regional trade in South Asia is the lowest of any region in the world. The reason why the ASEAN nations, the Eastern European nations have succeeded historically is because they traded so much with each other. India has just not been able to have better relations with its neighbors on the trade front in particular. So one thing I think that this government started on the right note in 2014, uh, but I think that since then, obviously other things have taken 
uh, over is that how little we trade in our neighborhood. And in the era of deglobalization, greater, regional, uh, greater regionalization is even more important. Uh, so I think that we have to focus a lot if we want to grow rapidly on how to have better relations across our neighbors, even if that excludes China for different reasons, given the tensions with them. But in general, I think we have to focus on the fact that why is South Asia, uh, South Asia has the lowest trade of any sub-region in the world. Thanks, Ruchi. May I now invite Mr. S.P. Shukla, Chairman of Fiki Defense and Aerospace Committee and a group president and member of the group executive board of Mahindra Group to please uh, ask a question to Ruchi. Thank you so much. And Ruchi, once again, welcome. Thank you so much for that insightful talk. Really, it was very engaging. In Indian industry, you have many keen followers who, who value your observations, and I happen to be one of them. Thank you, sir. Uh, we talked about the last decade being the lost decade for the emerging economies. Very apt observation. I'll remember this phrase, accepting China. So we are looking ahead at the next decade. In India, we have disproportionate number of people dependent on agriculture. It accounts for very small percentage of GDP, but a very high percentage of people are dependent. Many countries, developed countries, went from agricultural society to industrial economy. India went from agriculture to services in a big way. Today, services account for 50% of our economy. The question is this. If we look ahead at the next decade, and we know the situation evolving in terms of global trade, global economy, and most importantly, demographics, where consumption in industrial economies will not grow as fast as it did in the past. What options does our country have for growing GDP as well as employment? Are we better off with services? Are we better off on manufacturing? Of course, one will say both. But between the two, which will generate more bang for buck is my query to you, please. And, and side query, how long we will continue to be called emerging economy when you are among the three largest economies of the world and among the top seven stock exchanges of the world. Thank you. Sure. So I think that as far as emerging economy is concerned, the definition is very clear. It's based on per capita income. Uh, so uh, if we have a per capita income of more than $20,000 or so, we'll be known as an advanced economy. But uh, even China is still called an emerging economy because its per capita income is still $10,000. So that's a, uh, that's a definitional thing. That, uh, but if you want to call yourself something else, that's very different. Uh, this is just a definitional thing. So I think that that's as far as that's concerned. Now, uh, now, as I said, it was very cool to be called an emerging economy 10 years ago. Now, because of what's happened in the last decade, it's not been uh, that sort of uh, cool. But the answer to the first question to me, based on history, is very clear. It's always been manufacturing. Services has never been able to generate the kind of economic growth rate that you, you want, which is, you know, of, of more than 5 6%. So if you look at the global economy, before 1950, there were virtually no recorded cases of any economy having grown at a rate of 7, 8, 9% on a sustained basis. After 1950, because we had a boom in global trade, boom in globalization, and much more export manufacturing, we had economies able to grow at 7, 8, 9%. There is no economy in the world that I know of that has been able to grow rapidly on the back of just services. So I think that manufacturing will be key. The biggest success story that I've written about in East Asia these days is Vietnam. It's, it's on the back of manufacturing. And as far as India is concerned, the good news is that we are seeing some increases. It's still not at the same magnitude as Vietnam, but we are seeing some increases in both exports as a share of GDP, manufacturing as a share of GDP, as, a, as I show there. So if you want to grow rapidly, that is the only secret sauce that I know of. Now, something new may emerge. As I said, uh, because of digitization, you may have new things which emerge. But will that be a, a mass employment creator like manufacturing? I doubt it. Uh, because it just, 
is not as labor intensive thanks uh, thanks for chair you know we are running out of time and uh, we would have loved to ask you many more questions but uh, may i now ask sangeeta our president of fiki to just uh, give you a word of thanks please sangeeta over to you so ruchi thank you so much i think this was um, extremely insightful and we feel privileged to have the benefit of your in depth knowledge research analytics and constant tracking and be able to see the essence of it in just 20 minutes so that that is uh, something quite amazing uh, i'm going to you know take the liberty of sharing two points of view because over the last year we have spent a lot of time looking at the economy understanding the government policy and really uh, analyzing so first uh, despite the fact that i'm not an economist and greatly respect your views i want to challenge the fact that i believe that the indian economy will grow faster than 5% uh, i think we're putting we're pegging that at upwards of 9 9.9% and saying that we can in 21 22 grow faster than uh, the chinese economy we also realize that uh, you know we need to grow at 12% to reach some of our targets but the 9 to 10% is is definitely happening and it is linked to one of your points and that is the pli uh, and the atmanirbhar bharat the the manufacturing focus so as you very interestingly put it can we export our way to prosperity because of the change in globalization this may be difficult but it's still a growing positive trajectory for us but the point i would add in there is really different from many of the other economies that you were comparing the size of our domestic market is extremely large and therefore we can uh, create this growth momentum on the back of manufacturing i also would like to add that among the four important points that you put up which i thought were really great the manufacturing path the commodity prices the pandemic driven reform and the digital revolution on the last two as well i think we're very well uh, positioned pandemic driven reform there's a lot happening across the ecosystem in terms of macroeconomic policy and you are seeing that you also called out the positive reforms in labor and agri and those are going to benefit the country but on the digital reform i was very sad that india's name was not in that list of countries ruchir because i think within upi i think the last stated was 2 billion transactions and 4 lakh crores of digital payments in october this is a fantastic number so hopefully very soon uh, you, you will be putting india in the digital uh, group of category as well but let me end by saying that it's been a fascinating conversation i want to thank uh, sanji for his great moderation thank you for spending your time and being with us i know you must be jet lagged but it's been amazing to see uh, your fresh insights and the positive value of your research uh, we look forward to you staying in touch continuing to guide fiki in terms of what we should be doing to push the economy because this is our inspired india we are aligned we have a road map and we're going to make it happen thank you so much ruchir all the very best for the great work that you do namaste thank you